Ifru by Flora Wapa. Chapter 6 Ifru came back after a month and vowed that it was over with her and Adizwa. She told herself that even if Adizwa came back and begged her on his knees with a bag of money, she would not listen to him. She did not only go to Agbo, but Ndoni, Akiri, and Ogbo, in search of her husband, and nowhere did she learn anything about him except in Ogbo, where she was told that Adizwa was seen there only a week before. A week after her return from Agbo, she called her mother-in-law. Mother, I cannot stay anymore. A man said that he had wept for the death that killed his friend, but he did not wish that death to kill him. I cannot wait indefinitely for Adizua. You can bear witness that I have tried my best. I am still young and wish to marry again. It will be unfair both to you and your son if I begin to encourage men who would like to marry me while still in this house. Ifru's mother-in-law did not say anything to Ifru. Ifru then told Ajanupu and her father. My daughter, Ajanupu said when Ifru finished, Adizua has treated you badly and you have borne it admirably. If your daughter were alive, one would have said don't go, stay for your daughter's sake. But Ogonim is no more and one does not know how to persuade you to stay. But I say, Stay. I have no reason whatever for asking you to stay, but stay. No, I will not stay, Ifru said. I am sorry, but I have to disappoint you. Adizwa does not want me anymore. It is so obvious. Do you want me to stay until he comes home and tells me to pack? That will be very shameful. You don't want this to happen to your daughter. For once in her life, Ajanapu had nothing to say. The next day, Ifru packed up all her things and took them from Adizu's house to her father's house. Her room was still empty. It was her mother's room. She swept it and rubbed it with red more than charcoal. Then she rubbed the sitting room and the walls. She used white clay for the walls and put in very beautiful designs typical of her people. Ogia was busy drawing water and grinding the white clay the red more than the charcoal. She wouldn't allow Ogia to rob the world because she had no talent how to do it properly. Charcoal was used for the floor, white mold for the walls and red mold for the mold benches in the sitting room. Then the designs were beautifully worked out with the three colors. Ifru did not only beautify her own room but also her father's. She rubbed her father's room and his obi and scrubbed the ofo, the chi and many other things that needed scrubbing. Her father's walking stick was scrubbed and the brass end was thoroughly scrubbed with the white sand of the stream. Then she took all the cooking utensils to the stream and washed them. The mortar for pounding fufu was well scrubbed. Some people were surprised to see her in the stream and they talked in whispers. One of the women spoke out. Ifru, the daughter of Mwashiko Yogene, welcome to your father's house. You did well, my daughter. We are sorry that your husband has rubbed charcoal on your face, but we are also glad that you have left him to come back to us. We women married to men of your village are very happy, and so, when we see women of your village being ill-treated by their husbands, will feel it very keenly. You have done well to come back. You are young, beautiful, and of good parentage, so you will soon have a good husband. You are right, another woman took over. We are happy that you have left him. It is an ugly woman who looks for a husband. God will soon bless you with a good man who will look after you. If he was busy scrubbing her cooking utensils, the women drew their water and went home. Poor child, she has suffered, one went on. I heard that her husband could not even afford the diary. Yes, so it happened, the others said. He could not afford the diary. If we had to work hard trading in so many things, and when they got the money, they went and paid the diary. They were very happy together until Adizwa went to Ndoni more than a year ago and refused to return. 
Oh, was that what happened? Yes, that was what happened. While he was away, their only child died, and he was sent for, and up till now, now that we are talking, he has not come back. Many people returned and said that he heard about the death of his child. Eh wo, is that true? This is an indirect way of asking a wife to go back to her father's house. Ifuru began to swim after scrubbing. When she finished, she packed her things into a big basin, placed it on her head and walked home. Eh wo, my daughter. A woman stopped her. Did I hear that you have left your husband? Yes, he has left me. Don't say that, my daughter. Don't say that. We say that a woman has left her husband, but never say that a husband has left his wife. Wives leave their husband, not the other way around. Ifuru began to laugh. It is the same thing to me. No, it is not the same thing. Tell me what happened, my daughter. It is a long story, mother. All right, I shall come to see you at home. I am sorry. Ifuru put her things in order in her father's house and went about her business as usual. Ogie was very useful to her. The little girl had grown to love her mistress. She regarded her as her mother and called her mother. She defended her anywhere she heard people say ill about her. She did all she was asked to do and respected and admired her mistress. She did remember her parents, but only vaguely, and once or twice Ifuru had tried to persuade her to go and see her parents in the farm, but she had refused to go. She did remember those days at the farm, when she and the other children went to swim in the river. She also remembered the time they went to fetch firewood in the bush and how they left their younger sisters behind crying because they wanted to go with them and they would not take them. How they frightened them by telling them that there were leopards and snakes in the bush. She also remembered how they went fishing with baskets and the boys with small hooks. Then the fishes they caught and how they boiled them putting in salt and pepper and eating them up before their parents returned from the farm. She also remembered the huge fufu they ate in the farm, how they ate and ate until their tummies protruded, and how they went about with bellies shining. It was a lazy life which they enjoyed, no doubt, but the life did not appeal to her now. She did not like staying with Ephraim at first, but Ephraim had treated her so well that in spite of the fact that she worked more in Ephraim's house than she did on the farm, she enjoyed staying with Ifuru and disliked the idea of going back to the farm. The harvest season came. Ogier's parents were late in harvesting their crops. Her father was ill and her mother was heavy with the child. The children were too small to be of much use to them. So they had to send for relatives who with friends helped them with the yams. Ogier's mother was very busy. She had to cook for the men who had come to help them to harvest their yams. In the morning, she boiled yam in a big pot for them and brought palm oil, in which plenty of pepper and salt had been added to the workers for breakfast. In the afternoon, she powdered huge piles of fufu for them, and as she prepared the fufu, her husband went to the river with his nets to catch fish for the afternoon meal. Ogier's mother did this for several days until all the yams were harvested. Packing the yams into the canoe was another difficult job for a man who had been ill for a long time. Nevertheless, with the help of the children and some neighbors, Ogier's parents managed to pack all their yams into their canoe and the next day they set out for the town with their children. Before it was dark, they arrived in town after paddling upstream for several hours. Because it was late, they could not carry the yams to their house. The carriers of the yams had all gone home. These carriers came to help the farmers carry their yams to their houses. They were given a few yams when they finished their work. The farmers teased them because they only came during harvest season and not during planting season when their service were needed most. So the farmers nicknamed them those who come during harvest. The following morning, those who came during harvest came in great numbers and helped Ogier's parents with the yams. 
In the evening, they had stored all the yams in the back of the house, and by the time they had a bath and something to eat, it was very late. But Ogier's mother insisted on seeing Ifru that night. When they arrived, Ogier was the first to see them. She greeted them and asked them to sit down while she went to call her mistress. Welcome, Mwosu Obukia. Welcome, Mwabata Anama. Please sit down. What brings you here at this time of the night? Well, we returned yesterday night, and because there was nobody to help with the yams, I had to sleep in the canoe till this morning. We have our yams stored at the back of our house now, and we felt we must come and pay our respects. Oh, is that so? Welcome, welcome. Farm people, how is the farm? The farm is there, answered Ogier's mother. Just as we left it, she added. We were almost the last people to leave. You heard of the illness of my husband. Eh, woe, I heard it, my sister. Pardon me. How are you, Mosu? Are you better? I am much better now. Let's leave the rest to God. I have never been so ill before in my life. I could neither bend down nor stand up. I was all the time in bed. I am still feeling the pain, but it is milder now. Where exactly do you have the pain, if I may ask? Asked Ifru, feeling very sorry for Mosu. If Ogier's mother had been a white woman, you would have seen her blush. If a disease does not hide itself, I won't hide it either, said Ogier's father, and he continued. Ifru, the pain is below my navel and he tried to indicate the place. Sometimes it is swollen, some other times it is so painful, I can hardly sit down or stand up. Ogier, please bring Kola for your parents. Please leave Kola not this night, night has taken Kola. Don't you know that saying? Ogier's mother said. I know the saying, Ifru said laughing and showing her white seats made whiter by the night. Night takes collar only when one has no collar. They all laughed and Ogie brought the collar in the collar dish and placed it in front of her father. Thank you, my daughter, Ogie's father said. Ogie has grown so tall, he remarked. Yes, she has grown very tall, Ogie's mother said. Mosu broke the collar, took a piece and passed it to his wife, who took one piece but said she would not chew it because it would keep her awake all night. Kola does nothing to me, Ifuru said. Not to me, said Ogier's father. Ifuru then went into the room and brought out a bottle of gin and a ganashi. She gave the bottle and the ganashi to Mosu. He filled it up and drank it in a gulp. He gave the ganashi back to Ifuru, who gave it to Ogier's mother. She filled it with the gin took a sip, made a grimace, and handed the ganache back to her husband. He drank it in one gulp and gave the ganache to Ifuru. Do you want another? asked Ifuru. Won't you drink? Mosu asked Ifuru. No, I don't drink it. It is too strong for me. It is meant for men, not women. And as she said this, she poured another and gave Mosu to drink. He drank it all in one gulp again. Please don't give him any more, pleaded Ogier's mother. He will soon be drunk. Ogier, please take the bottle in. Your father will soon be drunk if the bottle is left here. Let's hear something, Mosu said. If I get drunk, you will have to take me home. They laughed. Do you know Omezere? Ifru asked. Which Omezere? The drunkard? Yes, the drunkard. He was a pleasant man and when he died, it was a great loss for all children in those days. When he was drunk, and this happened every day, he came to us and if we were eating, he would eat with us. If we were playing, he would play with us. Sometimes he went on all fours and we mounted on his back and had a good ride. He taught us songs he sang like a young boy. When we heard the voice of his wife, we would all run away and watch them from a distance. Foolish man, an overgrown child, stupid man, a man who has children and cannot afford to feed them, but drinks every day and plays with children. She would drag him home 
and he surprisingly enough went meekly with her. Then we children followed. At home, he would ask his wife to bring food for he was hungry. There is no food, the wife would shout. Cook food then, he said not perturbed. Cook food indeed, cook food indeed. So you want me to cook food? Will I cook my hand? Eh? The drunkard, will I cook my hand? The bastard, will I steal to cook for you? As she said this, almost Zero would fall asleep on the mud bench in the sitting room. This happened nearly every day and we children wondered whether his wife ever cooked a meal for him. People should drink with moderation. I know of farmers who wash their mouths every morning with a ganache of gin. That is bad if Ruanogia's mother agreed. After a long time, during which they talked generally, Mosu cleared his truth and said, Efuro, we heard what happened. It is a long time now, and we don't want to refresh your memory. But if one does not refer to it, one would be misunderstood. Nobody owns this world, or people call their children. Onwamebu, death does not know how to kill, and onwuzuribo, death is universal. So take heart, my daughter. Thank you, Ifuri said. Then, just before we returned, we heard that you have left Adizua. We don't know why you have taken this decision, nor are we here as judges. But a man whose only child died and who could not come home to bury his only child and console his wife must be a very bad man. It showed that he hates his wife, so you have done well in leaving him. You are young, so the day is just breaking for you. Other suitors will come. Just have patience. Efuru again thanked them. The night is very dark, Ogier's father remarked. We are going. Thank you very much, Efuru. Ogia, let's day break. There was no answer. Ogier, Efuru called. The child was fast asleep. Children! How they sleep so easily. I wish I could sleep like that, Mosu said. In the few days that followed, Mwabata Ogier's mother was busy selling the yams in the market. Occasionally, her husband would come to see how she was getting on. He came on unquote day to help his wife when he saw a very well-dressed woman in European dress. The woman selected ten fat yams and asked, How much? in English. Ogier's mother did not, of course, understand. The woman asked again in English the second time, I say, how much? And again, Ogier's mother was at lost what to say. When she said it the third time, Mosu brushed his wife aside and said to the well-dressed woman in their language, What do you mean by how mock? For months I toyed in the farm, morning and afternoon, and now you come and say how mock, how mock your own too. It was then it dawned on the woman that they did not understand what she said. She looked up and looked down again. There was nobody to help her, and so she picked up her basket, and she and her maid went to another stall where she thought she would be understood. Just before Mwabata finished selling the yams, her husband became ill. It was the usual trouble again. He had worked very hard of late, and so this time the illness really knocked him down. For days he lay in the bamboo bed in their hut. It was difficult for him to get up. Mwabata, who was heavy with child, nursed him. She went to a dibia who gave her some leaves to boil for her husband. When the pain grew worse, she went to Ifuru and told her of her husband's illness. Mwosu is ill, she told Ifuru. He is very ill and I don't know whether he will recover. As she said this, she began to cry. Wipe your tears, Ifuru said to her. What is the nature of the illness? The usual one, the one he tried to explain to you when we came to you last time. All right, I shall take him to see Dr. Ozaro. I hear he will arrive from Onicha this evening. Mwabata thanked her and went home. That evening, Ifuru bought a big fresh asa fish from the evening market. She made a sala soup with the asa and pounded some fufu. Then she put the soup and the fufu in her best dishes and gave them to Ogier on a tray to take to Mosu. I am sure he has not had a good meal for a long time, she thought. 
When he eats well, then one will know how ill he really is, for hunger could play a major part in his illness. If Ruden went to see whether Dr. Ozaru had come, he arrived a few minutes before Ifuru came, and she was told that he was busy. But when the doctor heard Ifuru's voice, he came out at once and embraced her. You are looking very beautiful. He teased her. Welcome, Ifuru managed to say. They went into the consulting room. I heard you have left your husband. No, he has left me. It is about two months now since I left his house. But is he back yet? No, he is not back. I think he has gone for good. I hope your wife and children are well. Oh, they are very well. It is hunger only. Ifru laughed and showed her set of white teeth. No, Difu. If you talk about hunger, what do you expect us to do? Ifru remembered the doctor when he was only a boy. She lived with his mother. The doctor's mother, who was now dead, was a very respectable woman. She was among a handful of girls who went to school when fathers frowned at sending their daughters to school. She was the only one who had insisted on obtaining her standard six certificate, known in her day as as mended. She was going to the little church one Sunday when she saw a little girl run to her and embrace her. The little girl called her her friend and told her that she would like to live with her. Every time she passed that village, and if the little girl was playing with other children, she would run to her and embrace and ask her to take her home. So one day, the doctor's mother inquired about her and her parents were approached. Thus, Ifru came to live with the doctor's mother. The doctor and Ifru grew up together, and when Ifru was about 15 years old, she went back to her parents' house. She learned cooking, baking, and sewing from the doctor's mother. The doctor asked about her immediately, he returned from Yabak High College, and he was told that she was already married. What are you going to do now that you have left your husband? The doctor asked sympathetically. Nothing, just stay in my father's house and continue with my trade. Will you marry again? I shall think twice this time. That's a good girl. You think you were a little hasty before. Well, maybe I was. But the success of a marriage does not depend on that. Marriage is like picking a parcel from numerous parcels. If you are lucky, you pick a valuable one. It does not depend at all on the length of the courtship. You are right. That's why some men dread it. And some women too, added Ifuru. I don't think so. Women don't dread it. It is only we men who are scared of it, for we don't want to be roped in by you women. Perhaps you are right. It is a necessary evil for us. You know our people saying, Di Mogori, so you can understand. Well, I have come to see you. My mate's father is ill, and I would like you to examine him. What is the nature of the illness? Some swelling. All right, bring him to me when the sun goes down tomorrow. But remember, I am on holiday. I don't want to do any work, so don't tell people I am home. The next day at the appointed time, Ifuru and Wonsu arrived at the doctor's house. Ifuru introduced Wonsu and left the room. Where does it ail you? The doctor asked sympathetically. It was the tone of his voice, his sympathy and kindness, more than his medicine, that endeared him to his patients. Here, Moses said and pointed to the parts he meant. Remove your clothes and lie on the bed. The doctor examined him thoroughly. Get up and wear your clothes. When you finish, come to the next room. I'm going to give you an injection now, the doctor told him. But it is not just to help you for now. You will have to come to my hospital at Onicha for an operation. Unless you are operated upon, you won't be well. Don't worry, it is going to be an easy operation. There is nothing to fear. Ifuru was called in and the doctor told her that Mosu needed an operation. What kind of illness is this doctor? Mosu asked, very worried. You are lucky to have it detected now, the doctor told him. It is something to do with the male organ. Male organ? Our ancestors forbid. Nobody in my family has ever suffered from this disease of the male organ. That may be true, but you have it and we want to help you. Don't worry, 
It is nothing. The operation won't be long, and you will be in the hospital for a week or two depending on how you respond to my treatment. Mwosu went away more worried than he was before he saw the doctor. He told his wife what the doctor said, and she burst into tears. Mwosu sat on the bare floor, his hand on his chin, looking very miserable. You won't have this operation, Mwabata wept. I say, you will not have it. I don't trust these doctors. Think of it. They will first of all kill you, then they do the operation, and after, if they know they cannot kill you, they give you poison. Who will look after me and my children? No, no, you won't be operated on. Eh, woe, my world is very bad. I have come to suffer in this world. My ancestors, please help me. Please fight against my enemies. Wabata wept on and on. Don't take it so badly, my wife. I don't think it is as bad as you think. What are you saying? Eh, what are you saying? You want to die and leave me. Let's see how you would die and leave me with these children to look after. Already we have poured our first daughter, and I see now that we shall use all our children this way. Which is a shame. Which is a shame, Mosu. And you know it. You know. And now you want to be operated on so that you will die and leave me a widow with six children to look after. Mosu, you are wicked. Mosu, Madokaibeya, you are wicked. Woman, stop your nonsense. If you don't stop this nonsense now, and I raise my hand and descend it on you, you will not know yourself for days. Beat me! Beat me! You try and beat me. Beat a pregnant woman, and when I die, the police will accuse you of murder and hang you. Beat me! If you don't beat me now, shame on you! Shame on you! Mwosu looked at his wife, looked at her lean body, her protruding belly, hissed and went to his room and locked himself up. Coward! Coward! You are running away from a woman. You come and beat me. Mwabata said, banging at the door. The next day, Mwosu and his wife went to see Efru. Anybody seeing them then would not think that they were near blows the night before. When they got there, Efru and Ogie were in a very happy mood. They were laughing and there was a boy about seven years old on the floor who was crying. All right, Emeka, go well, Ifuri said, still laughing. What is the matter? Mwabata asked, interested in the cheerfulness of her daughter and Ifuru. Emeka wants to go, said Ifuru. And when he told us he wanted to go home, we said, All right, Emeka, go well, greet your mother and your brothers and sisters. But he started crying, Ogia said, and continued laughing. Mosu and Mwabata did not understand the joke at all. I will tell you the whole story, Ogier volunteered. Emeka came here when we were just about to start cooking. He played with the children and occasionally he would come to the kitchen, survey the place and go out again to play. Then the last time he came the food was ready. I was actually dishing it out when he ran in and said, Mama, I am going. Mama was busy and did not hear him. So he said again, Mama, I am going. Mama, of course, knew what the little boy was after. He wanted to have a formal invitation to lunch. So Mama said, All right, Emeka, go well. Then Emeka burst out crying. Mosu and Mwabata understood and began to laugh with Ifra and Ogier. Children, Mwabata said, There is no end to their tricks, and it is most interesting to see how they think they could take you for a ride. Ogier had already dished out Emeka's food. So she called him and asked him to eat. Emeka wiped his eyes quickly and fell to. Welcome, Ifuri said to Ogier's parents. Emeka did not allow me to welcome you properly. Children, how clever they think they are. Ogier, please bring a better mat from the mud wardrobe for your parents and remove that one. When Ogier brought the mat, Ifuri asked her to bring it nearer to her. Spread it there, she said. That's good, all right. Mosu and Mwabata, sit here and eat with me. You think well of us, that's why you always meet us eating or are about to eat. It is only a friend and well-wishers who meets one eating. Oh, thank you very much, Mwabata said. We ate before we came, just before we came. Come and eat again. Why do you always refuse to eat here? 
I don't like it. We are all one. But Wabata and Wosu were not persuaded. They still insisted that they had had lunch. So Ogie's parents waited as if Ruth slowly ate her lunch. As she was eating, one of Ajanopu's children came in. She greeted everybody one after the other. Mosu, Obukia, Anamma. She turned to Ogie's mother. Mwanonako. She greeted Ifuru. That's very good. Mwabata observed. Ajanopu is giving you very good training. Children should greet their elders when they see them. Adiewere, come this way and eat with me. Ogie, bring another plate. Thank you, Ifuru. What did you say? Ifuru asked in astonishment. You are a fool not to want to eat here. Didn't your mother tell you the relationship between us? Or did she tell you not to eat in my house? I am joking. She said quickly. Ajanapu will never tell you not to eat in my house, so wash your hands and eat. Adiyewere still refused to eat. Ifuru called Ogi and asked her to get a plate. When she brought it, she picked some fish from her dish and gave Adiyewere to eat. Adiyewere could not refuse that, so she took it and began to eat. As Adiyewere and Ifuru were eating, a troop of children with shining tummies in front of them were seen approaching. These children are just in time. The way the time themselves is admirable. If you have a late lunch, they are sure to be there to have it with you. If you have an early lunch, it suits them best. Oh dear, she called. Bring animal plates for the children. Bring more soup from the pot also. The children were seated, five of them. It seems as if they had a special invitation to lunch. Now wash your hands properly here and don't fight. Ogia nagged. She did not like these children at all. We washed our hands at home before coming, one of them said. Ifuru and others laughed. Silly child. Sir, if you wash your hands at home, you won't wash them again before you eat. Here is some water in a basin. Wash your hands well. Ifuru said to all of them. The children washed their hands on the basin and the water became very dirty. Now wait, Ifuru said. Don't eat yet. Ogie, please bring another basin of water. Ogie threw the dirty one away and brought fresh water. Now, wash again, Ifru commanded. They all washed again and even this time the water was still dirty. Then they began to eat. After some time, one of them got up and went to Ifru. You see, you see, Oputa does not want me to eat. He is asking me to go home. Oputa, why don't you want him to eat? Oputa got up. Wait for us, he told the other children and went to Ifuru. Yesterday we went to his sister, Oputa said. His sister gave us oranges and granuts, but he refused to give me. Is it true? Ifuru asked. Yes, said the boy looking down. Now don't do it again, go and eat. When the children had finished eating, they left and it was then that Mwosu and Mwabata had a chance to tell Ifuru the purpose of their visits. My husband told me that the doctor wants to operate on him. Since he came back yesterday, I have not been able to eat. I have been so upset that I was useless to myself. I am afraid of operations. Can't anything be done to him? Can't the doctor continue giving him injections? Hogia's father said nothing. He was in favor of the operation. Somehow he trusted the doctor immediately he saw him, but he dreaded his wife. I have heard what you have said, Ifru said at last. I don't want to persuade your husband to go, but I don't think you are doing the right thing by persuading your husband not to have the operation. In any case, if you change your mind and want to go for the operation, let me know so that I can send the word to the doctor. In a fortnight, Mosu came back, this time alone. That was the first time he had come to Ifru without his wife. I must go to the doctor. He said to Ifuru urgently, I must go. If I remain here, I shall die. When can the doctor see me? Go back again and discuss this with your wife and then come to me, Ifuru said. It was with great difficulty that Mwabata was convinced about the operation. Ogie went with her father to Onicha. The operation was successful and Mwosu remained there for a fortnight. By the time he came back, he was a changed man. He looked fresh and healthier. 
Mwabata could not believe her eyes when she saw her husband. She quite forgot that she had been firmly against the oppression that had brought life back to her husband. She embraced him many times. So, there is so much life in you, my husband. These white people are great. They are deep. Welcome home, my husband. Neighbors were equally glad to see him was looking so healthy. They greeted him warmly. They also went to Ifru and thanked her for saving Wosu's life. The town was in a festive mood when Wosu returned. It was the feast of the new year, the time of plenty. It did not matter whether a farmer had paid for the money borrowed for his farm or not. All that mattered was that the year's work had come to an end and it was time for feasting. So Wosu called his age group. He bought a bottle of schnapps and about three bottles of homemade gin. Then he bought several kegs of palm wine. His wife was in a festive mood too, and for a while they forgot that Ifuru's money was not paid. Mosu's age group came and danced and drank wine. After this, he killed a white cock for his chi, and his wife also killed a white cock for her own chi. Their chi had saved them from death, and therefore they were grateful. The children played an important part at this time. The moon was full. They organized themselves in groups and sang from door to door. Their song went like this. If you give us yam, mbengbelo choku e mbengbele, we shall take mbengbelo choku e mbengbele. If you give us fish, mbengbelo choku o mbengbele, we shall take mbengbelo choku e mbengbele. Let a male born live. Mbengbelo choku e mbengbele. Let a female born live. Mbengbelo choku o mbengbele. Women gave the children yam and fish, pepper, salt, and vegetables. When they were given any of these things, the children would then say, Thank you very much. Let what you have given us be replaced a hundredfold. You will give birth to one baby, implying that she would not have twins at a time until your house is filled with babies. When the children were tired, all that they had collected was given to the elders among them to keep. The next day, they had a feast. Plenty was left over, which was thrown away. Mosu and Mwabata were in a festive mood. When the children came round singing their song, Mosu was slightly tipsy after taking some homemade gin. Immediately, he heard the singing of the children. He came out from the room and began to dance. It was great fun for the children as this dance was for children only and men did not feature in Ngbengbele. Mwabata was worried because there was no yam at hand to give the children, and the young things did not want to be kept waiting. If you give us yam, fish, pepper, we shall take. They sang this again and again, and nothing was given them. We have spirits behind us. Nothing came out. Our throats are dry. We are losing our voices. Mose stopped dancing, went into his room and came out with two shillings. The children shouted with joy and thanked him. Thank you very much. Your wife gave birth to a baby boy, they said. Mose and Wabata were both at home on the day Ogie paid them a visit. Her brothers and sisters came to welcome her. What have you brought for us? They asked her. She gave them some ground nuts. Uge went into the room, saw a pot of soup in the mud wardrobe, and asked one of the children to make some gari for her. Let the children pound yam for you, her mother told her. I wonder how you can swallow that stuff. I cannot get it through my truth. You are right, mother. If Ru does not eat it, she says it scratches her throat. But I like it because it is easy to prepare. You make the fire, boil some water and make curry. Whereas, if you want yam fufu, you wait for the yam to be cooked. Then you pound it. It wastes so much time. You are lazy, that's all. You children of nowadays are lazy. Left for me, curry wouldn't be sold in the market. Ogia ate her curry and while she was eating, she asked her mother whether they had seen Ifru about the money they borrowed from her. Her mother's heart missed a bit. Did she say anything? No, 
but don't tell me you have not seen her again. And by the way, did you take yams to her? Mozu, come and hear what your daughter is saying. Oh dear, my daughter, I have been telling your father about this ever since we returned from the farm. He has been postponing it. And now we have not got yams that are worth giving to somebody like Efuru. Oh dear, I nagged and nagged. And when it was too much, I did not want any quarrel. I put my mouth in a bag and sealed it up. I don't want to be accused of being a male woman. Mosu, we are now in great in the sight of Ephraim and many others because we have eaten the parcel and the tanks. And now what? Woman, keep your mouth shut this instant. Are you drunk? When things go wrong, you always blame others and don't blame yourself. Keep quiet, I say. Well, but surprisingly enough, kept quiet.